Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. Hello, and welcome to Science Faction 432. Science Faction, the replication crisis is replicating. This sounds like a Battlestar Galactica fan-made sequel. This article did originally feature Edward James Almost as at least <laughs> one of the prime characters. Few people realize the work that he does in uh, both science uh, and sci-fi. Now, I know for a fact you, all you know about Battlestar Galactica is Edward James Almost. I know that for mm-hmm. a fact. Sure. I used to feel bad that I felt that like my nerd cred was mm-hmm. under attack because I had never seen really any of Battlestar Galactica. Are you giving me like a Tony Robbins nerd speech on how I need to up my nerd game? No, I'm not, because you and I are in the same boat. What I'm saying is don't feel bad about it. That oh. entire sci-fi series was created by Mormons. So oh. don't worry about it. All right. I thought you were going to give me like some sci-fi nerd version of The Secret, where if I just pretended I had watched it, then it would be okay. No, I mean, it's secret adjacent in that if you are reading any of the works of L. Ron Hubbard, you are supporting Scientology. I choose to believe that if I watch Battlestar Galactica, I am supporting Mormonism. All right. Well, and speaking of somebody who's the L. Ron Hubbard of this show, I, of course, am your host, comedian archaeologist Robert Timothy. And with me, as always, is my comedian, Mr. Damien Mercado. Damien, how are you doing this afternoon? I'm doing great. You, like the real L. Ron Hubbard, have set off explosive ordnance in Mexico. Yeah, using the U.S. military uh, ships, yes. Yeah, yeah, you, like like the famed leader of a religion, uh, were almost the catalyst for war with our southern neighbors. Yeah, I also gave myself numerous unearned, unwarranted, and unneeded ranks that would a- <laughs> apply to some kind of military that I was not involved with. Yeah, I, I really wish that we had the time to get into L. Ron Hubbard, but if all any of our fans are listening and you got time to fill during this quarantine, uh, I hate to plug a different podcast that we don't benefit from in any way, but check out Last Podcast on the Left's yeah. series on L. Ron Hubbard. It is so good, and you will find out... No matter how much of a piece of shit you thought he was, he's worse. So much worse. You also figure out that, like, I feel like hearing about L. Ron Hubbard made me feel like all the things adults tell you about the world are fake. Like, you can't just lie your way through stuff. You can't make up stories and have people believe you. Oh, if you want to be a military officer, you have to conduct yourself well and then go off to an academy and then actually get a commission. It turns out all you have to do is drink with a congressman during World War II. You know, you just had to be exponentially smarter than the mean average intelligence at the time. Like yeah. in World War II, you just had to be like, people were like, well, nobody would lie their way to become, we have modern technology. We've had electricity for years. I could smell a fake a mile away. And then it turns out if you're a, if you're a naval commander, you like having your ass kissed as much as anybody else. Yeah. And so if there's a guy with a silver tongue and, uh, and knows where a prostate is, he's becoming an officer. <laughs> And if you're looking for a podcast that'll make you laugh through this quarantine, check out Awful Neutral. Whereas Science Faction covers the hard physics of being a nerd, we cover the lazier, fatter, less financially independent nerd and the Dungeons and Dragons nerd. So The psychology of being a nerd. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, just as psychology gets more press than physics, Dungeons and Dragons nerds get way more press than science nerds, which is the way it should be. Well, uh, let's get right into that psychology stuff because that's about to kick in. So let's go right over to science articles. From molecules to particles, this is science articles. Now, as a Scientologist, I am taught that psychology isn't real. Do you have a response for that? You're a Phaeton, and you're a (laughs) suppressive person, and right now you are being exiled out of science faction Scientology, also known as Scientology faction. (laughs) As you say this, uh, Bobby Miscavige's henchman uh, (laughs) kick in the door and drag me out for corrective training. The worst part about that isn't, like, all the horrible things L. Ron Hubbard did or Scientology has done before. Like, the worst part is when you learn that uh, David Miscavige, who's, like, this tiny little angry man who heads Scientology, he beats the shit out of people at meetings. And there has to be nothing more frustrating than an angry five-foot, two-and-a-half guy hitting you with impunity because he knows you're not allowed to hit him back. Can we just get like a, a, a Steven Seagal-esque sleeper agent who will just activate and snap a neck after delivering some hot porridge to Miss yeah. 
I, I think it's hard to get on the inside now, but we'll talk about it later. I, I mean, maybe we'll just call Seagal. Yeah, I don't think he's doing anything right now. I don't know. I'm pretty deep in this Russian prostitute scam. <laughs> but I'm still legally a sheriff in Louisiana. Crazy, right? Article number one, the replication crisis is replicating. All right, we've talked about the replication crisis before. It's To me, it's one of the most interesting parts of science because it's basically science going, oh, fuck, we've been wrong for 50 years. And it's the only thing, like, if I'm somebody who hates science, and there's a lot of people out there, uh, ever since this quarantine has happened, I'm sure everybody's Facebook has realized that that stupid guy that you work with or perhaps you do from high school, suddenly it took... Everybody losing their job for him to get the confidence to come out to the world is, hey, everybody, I'm an idiot and you need to know this. <laughs> but there are actually some really good uh, critiques of science. Yeah. Uh, this is one of them, the replication crisis. And none of them ever, ever mentioned this. No, they don't wade into it, which I guess is probably a good thing. But the replication crisis is something that when I first learned about it, we covered it on Science Faction back when the it really started breaking in 2015. And it, it was like literally a philosophical issue for me because I had to look back at a lot of the things I believe and ask myself whether or not I have good reason to believe them. But it was mainly people who worked in the softer sciences like archaeology, uh, I, I actually believe there hasn't been a single archaeology study discredited during the replication crisis. I think Damien. that's because they're so boring that even the people who go back and double check these replications, uh, double check to see if this was a good study, they're just like too boring. Like, no, let's let's do another fish anus study because I cannot do one archaeology study. I cannot do any more archaeology studies. These panties are already soaking wet. <laughs> 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 the reviewers are all female. I don't know why that is. Yeah, so the replication crisis is this thing that started coming around around 2015, though actually the, the murmurings of it were maybe four or five years even before that, but where we basically discovered that a whole bunch of really prominent scientific articles and scientific research could not be replicated. That kind of is like the sly way of saying it's probably bullshit. When you say it can't be replicated, though, that doesn't necessarily mean that because it could mean that it's, it's true in certain circumstances and the replications are not mimicking those circumstances or whatever. But you have an incompetent scientist doing the replication. Yeah, exactly. But basically what we found was, and we're not talking about like they didn't pick the small journals. They picked the top 100 stories in the biggest journals like Nature, Science, Discover, that kind of shit. And they looked at it and a whole bunch of them were not replicable. Now, the biggest group of those came from psychology, about 70 think, percent of the studies, really good studies were unreplicable. Now, is it like this study out of Finland where like the psychological effects of being in a, in a society where everybody's six foot five, like you couldn't recreate that? Is that part of the replication crisis? <laughs> Yeah, it was hard when they tried to replicate that among the pygmies of Congo. I don't know why they went that direction. They could have gone anybody. <laughs> Just an average group, you know? You know, I, 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 I could see that happening. You know, like American scientists are like, no, we just simply, we, we don't fit the study. Chinese scientists are like, hell no. But these, they're like the uh, cool runnings of the scientific replication yeah. test community. This small little lab out of, uh, what part of Africa is the pygmy tribes in? The Congo? Yeah, this small little lab. You might have missed it if you if you didn't have a pygmy guiding mm -hmm. you there. It's really yeah. short, that's why. <laughs> it's, an incre it's an incredibly tiny lab. It's uh, very ADA compliant, surprisingly. When we found out we couldn't replicate even major studies, it was really jarring. And what it meant was that there's a whole bunch of science that is either wrong, very specifically misunderstood, fraudulent, or otherwise misunderstood because it can't be replicated. And that was a really big deal. I would say this is probably the biggest science story in the past 10 years. It's about science itself. And we had to start looking through. Now, obviously, there were things like physics where the replication crisis was not as bad, but it was still an issue. Even in physics, something you think is hard and fast, we found that there was still an issue. And we know that there's a lot of ways to do that. There's a lot of questionable practices, scientific practices, that can lead to results that are not good, even though you're not committing fraud. You can do things like p-hacking, where you're basically fudging the numbers to try and make something seem statistically significant when it's not necessarily. You have the file drawer effect, where you try 100 experiments and one of them works, so you put the other 99 in the file drawer, only publish that one. Now you've taken away the statistical significance because it might only be a one in 100 chance. Yeah, that makes a lot more sense than shutting your testicles in a file drawer. I don't know why that was the first place. So that brings up another thing that you can do to alter a test. Which is to stop it prematurely, meaning I'm getting a whole bunch of data, a whole bunch of data, a whole bunch of data. and File drawer testicles. 
Yes, you, you smash your testicles in a file drawer and you just stop it arbitrarily at a random point when you know the data will kind of gear towards what you're saying. So normally, instead of going like, I'm going to do this test for a year, you do it. And then six months in, you go, ooh, because of the data that came in today, if we stop right now, we'll be right, you know? So there's all these different ways that you can kind of manipulate data. And you hope that researchers are ethical enough not to do it, but you forget that there's publish or perish in almost every single university system where if you're not publishing in big major journals and you're not publishing new exciting research all the time, your university kills you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They do the thumbs down like a Roman emperor in the Colosseum. No, no, please. I published. I'm looking at this study. It's on the uh, pencils on my desk. No, please. <laughs> Some guy executes you with a closely placed Tesla coil. Just... <laughs> <laughs> That's how he would have wanted to go. That's actually one of the pleasures of being the dean, is to execute yeah. the underperforming scientist. That's absolutely true. So it, it became this thing, and now a big deal is going back and seeing how we can, or if we can, replicate certain studies. And I gotta admit, this is a kind of fault of science. One is, sometimes when stuff gets published... It gets taken for granted without being replicated. I always say being published in a major scientific journal isn't the end of science. It's the beginning because then other people have to look at it and analyze it and do more experiments and more detailed experiments, et cetera, et cetera, replicate it, all that stuff. So there is that aspect to it. But there's also the aspect of doing better science in terms of we need to set the parameters beforehand. We found that the replication crisis essentially goes away when you pre-register experiments, meaning I'm going to tell the journal ahead of time what I'm going to do, how I'm going to do it, the math I'm going to use, and exactly how long the experiment's going to take, et cetera, et cetera. Then I do the experiment, and then I turn it in. Now, I could still be committing fraud, but that's a really tiny percentage of what we're talking about. Most of it is just all those questionable practices we talked about. So pre-registering experiments seems to get rid of that. But again, one of the problems with science, and this is a, this is a hindrance that science has with the way we practice it right now. Catfishing. Yes, occasionally there's a really hot professor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, there's a super hot professor who's doing this awesome study on a perpetual motion machine, man. She <laughs> she was going to show it to me last month. We had it, and then, like, something came up. Her university had some deadline. I don't know. One of the problems is we do not put enough importance or prestige or respect or whatever you want to call it on replication experiments. Everybody wants to see you create some kind of novel experiment, do some kind of novel research so you for your PhD so that you can be a, an instructor or something like that. Nobody wants to just go see if the other guy was right. That doesn't make a great CV, right? So see, like, we've talked about this. We need to start raising the prestige of cover bands in the scientific yeah. community. Like maybe you you do it for your college. Like, hey, uh, we're the heart of your bunch of older Harvard scientists and you recreate Harvard experiments. Okay, see, I like where you're going with this, but I don't say older Harvard guys. I think you you pick like the bad boy scientists, right? They're all wearing leather jackets. The university has to fake their death. <laughs> they're flipping a large coin in the air at all times for some reason they're just walking around the school because think about it if you saw those guys and you were a researcher you're like holy fuck I hope they don't find a problem with my research I hope I don't get embarrassed by everybody when those toughs come out and find out that my chi-squared test didn't use the right parameters who reviews the reviewers I say as I'm led down the hall by a bunch of leather jacket wearing scientists so that's just the background of the replication crisis something I think is really important you can find our back episodes if you want to hear more about it because it's something that I am very very, very concerned about. However, a new article came out that isn't actually directly tied to the replication crisis, but is very interesting. This has to do with basically finding out that a whole bunch of psychology studies are not valid. And it's for a different reason than the replication crisis. Turns out Freud didn't know what the fuck he was talking about. Have you? He was just on yay the whole time. Like he had no idea what was going on. He would have loved the direction porn is taken now with all the stepmom stuff. This, we're living in Freud's time. Could you imagine if we, in a weird scientific version of Bill and Ted, we went back in time and combined Freud with Kinsey, and it was just a bunch of dudes just doing blow off research assistants and banging well into the morning. <laughs> I picture uh, Kinsey's mom being approached by Freud. So, are we going to do this or what? <laughs> it's three o'clock in the morning in Gary, Indiana. Why are you calling me, Mr. Sigmund? Yeah, they get super yayed out of their mind. They're like, oh, hold on, hold on. let's do the Milgram experiment. But instead, the guy thinks he's got a knob that makes the other guy come. <laughs> no, sir, I've got a heart condition. Why would anybody push the knob? <laughs> push the knob. The guy just needs to come. I'm, like, I'm picturing all the moaning on the other end. Oh, man, I'm so close. You've been edging me for hours. Please. 
this is just an experiment in homophobia more more so than one's ability to empathize with others. It's sad that we as a species would rather administer an electric shock than we would help a bro come. What I love is that there's like three psychology jokes in there that anybody who has an even undergrad uh, psychology background is just going to just giggle, giggle incessantly for. What this new report found was a whole bunch of major psychology experiments. Again, they went through major journals. They're not doing the little crappy experiments that we all expect to be bad because they're published in like things I thought of monthly. Like they're going in psychology today and plus one and all this stuff. They are finding that a whole bunch of the psychology experiments are invalid, not because they're not replicable, but rather because literally the experiments are done wrong. We're going to use some terminology that's a little weird. We're going to talk about measures. So if you think about what a researcher is investigating, they're trying to see if they can use a manipulation, the independent variable of, a, of an experiment, so something that you can change in an environment. They have to use a manipulation to try and get some kind of effect on somebody. But what they're measuring, like let's say they're measuring for anger, right? And they say, hey, we want to, the manipulation is we're going to cause this person anger and then we're going to see what the effect is on their reasoning ability while driving, whatever it is, right? But you forget to measure the girth. <laughs> well, but what if the thing that you're doing isn't inducing anger, it's inducing melancholy or sadness or depression, right? Well, then your assumption that anger causes delayed responses in driving is totally bullshit because it's actually melancholy that's causing that, right? And what they found is this is a very basic mistake. It's basically ensuring the validity of these evaluations. Like, what is it that you're actually testing? And in the vast majority of these cases, they found that these experiments, which usually use basically their own measures of validity, because you've got to think each experiment, you're going to have to do something different, right? So yelling racial slurs at somebody is not going to be the standard cause of action for every single psychology experiment. Yeah, are you doing this in Texas? Are you doing it at the Berkeley campus? That's... So usually each of these psychology experiments comes up with their own kind of measures, their own manipulations. And what they realized is in doing so, almost every one of these people are using untested manipulations that we have no idea how valid they are. We don't know if your manipulation is causing anger or melancholy or something else. And so your entire experiment is essentially invalid. Now, it might be that you have in indeed induced anger in that person. We're not saying you have it. But what we're saying is we can't prove that's what you're doing. You're making an assumption assumption and your entire work is based on these assumptions and it turns out that this is not a small problem when they checked these manipulations about two-fifths of them relied solely on people just essentially saying i think this is what it does that's like almost half of these from the get-go are essentially completely invalid experiments you're talking about some of the best most rigorous published psychology experiments on earth this is huge news again this is something that's going to slip right under the radar but essentially what they're saying is hey these psychologists especially social psychologists they haven't actually done the homework to do the experiments, and therefore these experiments are probably not as valid as they're being made out to be. So this goes under the radar. Uh, also, collectively, psychology as a profession just had a sigh of relief. They just got away with it. But at the same time, people who work in the harder, scienti harder sciences, the, the physicists, the chemists, mm -hmm. they saw this. And so... They can walk around without shame in public, but when they go to the university campus, they still get shamed, right? The psychologists or the physicists? The psychologists, by the physicists and by the chemists. Yes. Well, I mean, so here's the deal. If you think about it like that comparison with physics, you know, with physics, what they would say is the experiment we actually want to do is to see how red light affects a radio wave interference line or something like that. And so they'd say red light is defined as light with this particular wavelength. And so we're hitting light with this particular wavelength. Across this radial line, we're going to see if it, it causes any interference. What we're talking about in psychology is they're still doing the same experiment. The same experiment is being done right, except they're not actually sure they're using red light. What they're using, they're saying, I think this is red light, but it also might be orange. And that's the problem. So the issue isn't fraud. It's not any of the other questionable practices we talked about before. It is literally just not being sure that the thing, the manipulation you're using is actually the one you think it is. 
question, Bobby. You are in charge of this experiment. You have to decide on a way to make people angry, Uh trigger anger, in a large enough sample size of the population to conduct this experiment. What do you do to piss off your average American? This is an American study. Okay. I mean, apparently he put him in quarantine for a reasonable reason, but... uh... (laughs) Turns out if you lock kids in cages, only like there's just 43% of the country just doesn't give a fuck. If I wanted to induce anger, like legit anger, in any male in the United States, here's what I would do. Remove, with some kind of chemical, the ability to have an orgasm. And instead, as the orgasm is about to happen, you get a really bad calf cramp. (laughs) No! The thing I've been lying about and doing sex for all these years is actually happening. Well, because if you just took away orgasm, then guys would just keep masturbating indefinitely until they died waiting for it to happen, right? But like, if there was a negative side effect, now all of a sudden you have to be wary, right? You can't just be shooting free throws from the line. Like, you, you want to make sure this bad boy goes in. It's pretty decent. Uh, I still think there'd be enough guys, a large enough percentage of the population is like, I gotta come. I don't, listen, I know 99% of the time my calf is going to fucking fall off but yeah i mean they, they wouldn't be walking so <laughs> those brave heroes coming so we can all right i have two answers one i think is if you put somebody who is legitimately a flat earther like the one you debated years uh-huh. ago sure uh, and have them sit in the car so like the the goal is to see where they uh when they get mad from point a to point b uh-huh. we just have them ride around and preach and condescendingly call you an idiot for not believing in flat earth for five minutes your average person will be quite pissed that is if they true. don't tell him to fuck off. That is true. Actually, one of the harder parts of that Flat Earth debate was literally keeping other people from harming the person I was debating. And that, that there was a lot of people who wanted to do that. Now, and then I think for the other one, I think for if it's a woman, I think you have a man mansplains their profession to them. Oh, okay. Uh, when they're driving. <laughs> and then if you're a, a man, you just have a woman explain anything to you. And... Sh- <laughs> And shut down your confidence whenever it happens. Uh, well, if we want to fix this actual problem, the the real way to do it is pre-registration of experiments. That will help out a lot. Pre-registration of experiments, as well as a set of pre-established valid manipulations and what they're manipulating. And once you kind of get all that stuff out, you can get back to business. But this is really interesting. This is another huge wake-up call for psychology. And I know most of you probably have never heard of the replication crisis, But that was the first big wake-up call, and this is the second. So it may even explain some of the replication crisis because issues like this can actually explain why some experiments are not replicable. You could imagine if some person has thought they were inducing anger and instead they were inducing insecurity, they'd get... Labor. Inducing labor. When you try and induce anger and instead you induce labor, you get a premature baby? I don't know. What's the old saying? (laughs) (laughs) That's actually how fetal alcohol syndrome is. All right, on to article number two, why elephants get drunk way easier than you think. Maybe. Now, is it that, like, you're never going to catch an elephant slurring his speech because they always remember how to talk properly? Or maybe they're just so embarrassed about drunken antics that they don't perform them because they'll never forget how bad they felt. Or there's so, so few vehicles set up for an elephant to drive that DUI statistics aren't even collected on elephants. Mm-hmm. The, here's what's interesting. We talk a lot about pseudoscience and people bringing up pseudoscientific ideas, but there's also legitimate controversies in scientific disciplines, ones in which half the field are on one side, half the field are on the other, and, and it's you know a bitter argument, and eventually it usually gets solved with more science, with more publication when we get to the right answer. But if you were, if the argument was, can Wolverine from the X Men comics yes. get drunk? I could see a legitimate fifty percent. Like, well, he drinks a lot. You yes. see that. But I mean, his body. All he also has a super high metabolism that makes him immune to poison. So with this, could he even get drunk? And if he got drunk, would it only be for two minutes at yeah. a time? And does adamantium somehow catalyze alcohol in such a way that it makes it inactive in, in the rest of the body? It actually causes infertility. That's actually the downside when you mix two. But with an elephant, it has a body. If it responds to, I mean, I, you give me a large enough IV, I'll find out whether or not an elephant can get drunk. Well, we're going to get into that, David. Uh, <laughs> so believe it or not, one of these age-old scientific disputes is, do elephants get drunk? Well, that's a Shel Silverstein book, right? <laughs> Where the sidewalk ends in a passed out elephant in the bushes. <laughs> Stay away. Stay away. Just call the police. 
Do not disturb the elephant. Trunk-related domestic abuse. <laughs> a very special Shel Silverstein book. <laughs> Horton hears a shut the fuck up. <laughs> I said what to you last night, sweetie? I am so sorry. I thought I heard some disrespect coming uh, from your mouth. Uh, indeed. So, like, since the 1800s, people have recognized that elephants will, like, eat ripe or overly ripe fermented dish fruit and kind of act a little weird and seem to enjoy it, seem to maybe even seek it out and act a little bit as if they're inebriated. Oh, you're telling me that there weren't a bunch of 1800 sailors who were in Thailand who didn't take a barrel of beer and put it out in front of the <laughs> elephant, too? I'm saying that there's a lot of ways... People could have observed elephants drinking. True. Very true. I don't think, I feel like back then, like beer, like alcohol was so precious, you would not waste it. And you didn't really care. You're a sea, you're like a, a sailor. You don't care about science or whether or not an elephant gets drunk. You're just here to like drink that beer yourself and have sex with that elephant. <laughs> no, that elephant saved your life in Nam. You uh -huh. know it. <laughs> have you seen Operation Dumbo Drop? So it's gone back and forth, and indeed, some researchers at one point literally just took a trough. They had two troughs of water uh, for some elephants, and they spiked one with a bunch of grain alcohol. And the elephants drank it and seemingly were pretty happy with it. They were a little wobbly and, as one pointed, somewhat aggressive. Meaning that, like, I actually think the Simpsons portrayal of Stampy was fairly accurate. <laughs> Elephants are a lot like people. Some are just jerks. And some are drunk. However, there's been a dispute. No, they're not actually getting drunk. No, they couldn't get drunk. In fact, in 2006, what was considered to be the definitive answer was done when a psychologist actually did all this stuff. And he said, look, even if they're eating the ripest of mangoes and even if they're getting the most alcohol out of it, based on the amount they eat, look at their body size. It's physically impossible for them to get drunk. Mic drop, I'm done. Elephants don't get drunk. And that's where stuff sat for about 10 years. Well, starting recently, a few years ago, they went back and started going, well, maybe we made a, a mistake here. And tested some lame-ass elephants. <laughs> yeah, maybe these were like Mormon elephants. <laughs> Teetotaling elephants. So what they actually did is they, they noticed that a different animal, the tree shrew, could have almost unlimited amounts of alcohol. Like this animal can drink its body weight and booze and not be fucked up at all. I know, it was our fraternity's mascot. Yeah, <laughs> any really smart fraternity should adopt the tree shrew. Or, if you were in university, you should adopt the tree shrew and then claim that any kid who dies of alcohol poisoning on your campus was uh, not a true member of your school in the first place, and then you don't have to pay the parents anything. <laughs> The no true tree shrew argument. It's a logical <laughs> fallacy. <laughs> so they found out that this tree shrew could drink a whole lot without getting fucked up. And they wondered, maybe, maybe it's a big range. Maybe it's not just body weight. And so they started looking and they found that specifically there is a particular gene called ADH7. And this gene essentially helps us metabolize alcohol. Now, in normal mammals, you have one copy of it. In humans and all other African primates, we actually have a specific copy that is 40 times stronger than your average mammalian copy. 40 times. And the reason for that is because we are, or to some extent, some of the animals that are no longer are, descended from animals that were frugivores. So we were eating a lot of fruit. What'd you call me, you, you piece of shit? <laughs> if you eat a lot of fruit, you're going to eat some fermented fruit. And if you have not a lot of protection against alcohol, you're going to be shit housed by 1030 a.m. and you're just going to suck at getting stuff out of the savanna. Which is why we used to have to put a condom over the mangoes that we ate just to yes. get that protection. Yes, exactly. Oh, man, this spermicide makes me not want to eat the rest of this mango. Oh, my God. And so we have this kind of special one, right? Well, what they also realized is there's a whole bunch of animals, uh, mammals specifically, that actually lost that ADH7 gene throughout evolution. They're widely varying. It seems to have happened a few different times. And they include armadillos, rhinoceros, beavers. Bulldogs and the rest of the fraternity mascots on campus, bro. Well, you may notice that all of those are animals that don't eat fruit. So it makes sense. You can lose that gene and it's not a big deal because you're not going to eat anything that has alcohol in it. So you don't need protection against alcohol. 
Elephants are the one exception. They're the ones that lost that gene and still do eat fruit. And when they did the calculations, they realized, oh man, not only do we have a huge tolerance, so you can't do it by our tolerance, we're 40 times better than any mammal, but they don't even have the regular mammal tolerance. They have hindered mammal tolerance. And when they did the math, they're like, no, no, no. We do think these elephants can get wasted on these mangoes. Now, to be fair, this is not settled science. It's not like they like sat an elephant down at a bar and fed him fermented mangoes until he started letting some racial slurs slip every once in a while. <laughs> not on my tab. Let me tell you about black rhinos. Uh, check. Check, please. <laughs> yes. Mic's off. We need to turn the mics off for this part of the experiment. <laughs> but now the argument is, hey, Mr. 2006 article that says there's no way elephants can get fucked up. We think they can. And now science has to settle it. And my favorite part about this is sooner or later, somebody is going to settle this with a bucket full of grain alcohol. And we're going to get to see the results. Listen, bros, one fraternity is going to be credit for this study. I'm saying it could be us alphas. I just think it would be funny if like next time... We went to the zoo. There was just like one elephant who was wearing like a super tight affliction shirt and like causing shit with other <laughs> elephants. <laughs> I'm picturing more. I, okay, I went about this the wrong way. I do like that the transformation of the elephant as it turns the fraternity. <laughs> but I'm picturing like if we go to the San Diego Zoo, one of the most prestigious zoos, and you know how elephants can do, tri you know, trick stand on two legs yeah. and everything. We get a, an elephant doing a keg stand, and it has like, oh, we brought in some specialists from San Diego State to uh, to help us with this study because none of those <laughs> nerd ass scientists knew how to get it themselves drunk, let alone an elephant. Oh dear. So anyway, long story short, who wants to get kicked out of a zoo with me? <laughs> it's, just cough a lot now. They'll 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 keep their hands off you. All right, thank you, audience, for coming back for Science Faction 432, where you learned all about the replication crisis, a new problem in psychology, and why elephants might be able to get drunk. Thank you so much for joining us, and come on back this Thursday for Science Faction 433. You know, everybody loves Dumbo, but I'll tell you what I didn't like about Dumbo, his friendship with those damn crows. You've been listening to Science Faction. That's not right.